Good afternoon and welcome to the Columbus Metropolitan Club. We're streaming live from the Boathouse at Confluence Park. I'm Jane Scott and it's a pleasure and a privilege to serve as the president and CEO of the Columbus Metropolitan Club and to welcome you to our forum today. Today's forum is a new lesson plan for education. Our partners for the special report live stream series are NBC4, NBC4i, WSU Public Media, PNC, the Tom E. Daly Foundation, MORPSI, the Columbus uh, OSU Wexner Medical Center, and the Dispatch Media Group. We're very grateful for their support through this past series. A May 17 Columbus Dispatch editorial noted, the exact form that public schooling will take in the next school year isn't clear yet. Even if students return to the classrooms, it's likely to be in a limited format. The changes wrought by the coronavirus are as good a starting point as any for system-wide change. The needs, the opportunities are clearer than ever. And colleges and universities are facing similar challenges. Leading the largest public school district in Ohio, serving over 51,000 students in 109 schools, empowering students for success in a global community, Superintendent of City Schools, Talisa Dixon. Welcome, Dr. Dixon. Leading a 1,600 student Catholic liberal arts institution on the city's northeastern corner that includes physician's assistant and teaching in its degree programs, please welcome the president of Ohio Dominican University, Dr. Robert Gavazzi. Dr. Gavazzi? And our host, award-winning journalist at NBC4 and CMC board member, Colleen Marshall. Colleen, we're looking forward to another excellent conversation. It's all yours. Thank you so much. And you both have a lot of questions coming from students and parents about how we move forward from this sudden shutdown that you also had to deal with. So I want each of you to start out today by telling me what is your thought process? The governor announced yesterday, Dr. Dixon, that schools can reopen in the fall. You both have to be worried about bringing COVID-19 into the classroom. So I'll start with you, Dr. Dixon. Right now, what is your path forward? Thank you. Well, our path forward, we have two options that we are going to um, offer to our families. One is a K-12 online option where families can say, I want my students to continue in an online platform and we will have that option available. Um, the second pathway is a more of a blended learning pathway where students are um, afforded the opportunity to go to school maybe one or two days a week um, and then the other two days um, they will be able to learn in an online platform and then one day we will have possibly a day that they can touch base with their teachers and maybe an intervention day. Um, but either pathway, we're still exploring both of them. We have nine working groups currently working in the district, and we will have it finalized at the end of June, so we will utilize July in informing all of our stakeholders what those final pathways will look like. When you say blended opportunities, where some will be learning online each day and some will be in the classroom each day, that sounds like it involves a lot of staffing because now you have to have teachers available at the online platform. It, it almost sounds like you have to double up on staffing. Is that feasible? Right now, no, it's not ideal. Um, and we recognize that we are potentially going to have an increase in cost for this. Um, and so those are some things that our working teams are looking at and they're gonna bring those back to the board to make, you know, make a final recommendation. But some families need our students to have, to, to touch base with their teachers, to be sitting in a classroom. We recognize that, but we want to make sure that we can do that and safely. You know, safety is going to be first and foremost. And if there is a way that we can get our students to our school building in a classroom, meet those health guidelines, then we will do it. If not, then we will have to look at other options. Well, Dr. Gervaisi, when you talk about safety, we know on a college campus that is communal living. Nice. We all know what dorms are like. We've all been crammed together in those tiny rooms and sharing bathroom space. For you, what's the path forward? 
We actually have been very fortunate in that flexibility and personal response has been a core part of uh, the university's strategic vision. And uh, already before the pandemic, uh, about 29% of our course sections were offered online. So it's, we're not new to that whole uh, modality. What it does require is very similar to uh, what Dr. Dixon has mentioned in terms of providing students with a range of options that they can choose to take their courses in class, a mixture of in class and online, or totally remote if they so choose, or if their circumstances change in the middle of the semester. We have a uh, campus-wide pandemic response task force that we call ODU Rising that has uh, a number of subcommittees, sub-task forces looking at each part of the college experience, residence life, academics, special events, visitors, and so on. And uh, we have been in touch with relevant health authorities. And just this week, we'll be publishing for our employees, faculty, and staff very detailed guidelines about a gradual return to campus. We are inviting our, our employees to return to campus as early as June 15th at their discretion in consultation with their supervisor because we certainly want to respect those who feel uh, they're in at-risk categories. And as the fall approaches, we'll also be, be creating very detailed guidelines for students. The big challenge will be to encourage students to see their responsibility in, in ensuring that all of us remain safe. You know, Dr. Dixon, we, we, as we look at safety, elementary schools in particular, keeping children separated and wearing, keeping a mask on their face. Is that something you envision? How, how, and when parents go back to work, the option of maybe only having children at school a couple of days a week, parents are going to be scrambling. How much of all of that is going into your thought process? All of that is. Uh, one of the things we are, uh, we're sending a survey out to our families and, and asking them, what is the best option for you? What's ideal? And then how can we make sure that we're meeting all of those things that parents may be asking? You know? um, and our task force, our working groups, have community stakeholders and teachers. So our elementary students, we know, you know we've seen videos and we've, we've um, counseled with other school districts that are looking at, you know, do we have hand sanitizing places when they come in, they come off the school bus, they're wearing masks on the school bus. What happens, the entire routine from once they come to our properties, what does that look like? And we have to be very thoughtful of that because we know that families want their students to come to us, be safe, safety first. So they're safe, then their learning occurs. So we've been very thoughtful about that. That's why we're asking the public to be patient with us. There, there are no easy answers. There's a lot of consultation with our health officials that are happening. We just want to make sure we do it right. You know, you can't start and do it wrong. You have to get it right so that families understand and trust that you have their children, best interests, and their safety at hand, so we have to get it right. How much of that involves figuring out things like the cafeteria, where everyone will have to have their mask off oh and gosh, they all yes. sit shoulder to shoulder? Yes, that and even a school bus. So we always say our school bus drivers are our students' first teacher. Right? So you're getting on the school bus. Where would that act, what would that look like? You know, there's recommendation that there's one student every other seat, right? And then once you get off the school bus, then you gotta you gotta wash your hands and then what happens when you eat breakfast and when you go into classrooms. So there are a lot of recommendations um, that have been provided, some guidance, and we're looking at that from the point that you come to the front door of the school. We have to have it very detailed of the actions that we want our students to take. So one student every other seat, that's going to involve a lot more buses. It seems like all of these processes require more and more and more in a time when the state is about to have a massive budget cut. Yeah. 
How much of the budgeting is are you thinking about for yeah, this? That, that's frustrating. Um, we have we, we're anticipating um, just masks, right? So we're ex anticipating spending millions just to be able to have masks for 50,000 students. And remember, we have about 9,000 employees. So you know the PPE is going to be expensive, but we have to have it. We must have it. So we are anticipating. Um, at least a 20% more that we're going to have to spend um, and with with PPE, and we know that revenues that are going to be lower, so we're anticipating 20% less in revenues. So, but um, we cannot compromise safety, and we're going to have to vet our processes clear and make sure parents understand that we're looking at every single avenue of this. And when we bring it to the board, we would have crossed our, all of our T's and dotted our I's and say, here's the pathway forward, this is how much it's going to cost, and this is how we believe that we can best educate our students. Are you talking about possibly a tax hike? That's up to the board. The board, we have made a recommendation. The board has to make a decision. We know that our school funding works. Um, we know there's some things that we potentially, um, we, we know that we, there's some things that we need um, and it's going to take funding to, to get those things. But we don't know if the timing is right, but the board has to make that decision on if the timing is right to move forward with that. And certainly private institutions have these same funding issues. This could be critical for every college and Absol university. Absolutely. I'm glad, Colleen. Thank you for raising the issue of cost because sometimes uh, it's easy to be tempted to think simplistically and to say, oh, online learning, that should save a lot of money. Well, it doesn't. It actually costs. Apart from the overwhelming health and safety costs that uh, Dr. Dixon mentioned, the very costs of instruction go up as well if you're going to maintain the quality of education. Because the only way that online learning saves money is if you dramatically increase volume so that instead of having 20 students in a class, you have 200 watching online at home. Well, that isn't the same kind of experience. Uh, analogously, if you go to a doctor, and now doctors are practicing telehealth, you still expect that personal attention. But now, with online and remote instruction, that technology costs. And we don't want to compromise the quality of instruction and the interaction between faculty and students because simply of distance. We want to make sure that that still obtains. So, and when so it's you, a challenge. When you say it, it still costs, you're right. So you have an instructor. You have a limited student body size. Right. So you have an instructor who would ordinarily be in the classroom with any specific sub subject. And in a private university, I went to a private university, you have smaller class sizes, maybe 20 people per class. Right. Right. So how would that technologically cost so much more? Is it because you have to have the, the infrastructure to be able to push this out to the students? Exactly. All of, we are, for example, right now, uh, and because we already were in the online space, it's not going to, the, the, the upgrade will be a lot, will be less than it would be if we were starting from scratch. But we're going to be upgrading almost all of our classrooms to be able to provide remote instruction. So that, for example, you mentioned 20. That's a good number of what mo a lot of what most of our classes would be. And if uh, a given classroom is not large enough to allow 20 students in the class with remote, uh, with social distancing, what we'll do is that 10 of those students will attend in person one day a week, and the other 10 would observe, would participate remotely, and then they'd reverse uh, for the other class or the other two classes. But that means that all the classrooms have to be equipped with technology to be able to be to have that remote experience. It really does change the experience does. for the student, right. does it? That what we think of as the typical college experience. Right. But we, we're, we're going. I just want to add, just as Dr. Dixon is going to be trying to create as much of a sense of normality as possible, we're going to be doing the same as well because that's really what our students of whatever age really are hoping for. Yeah. Yeah. And then I think to add to that is it allows us for our 
um, our high school students to kind of get an advance of what's going to happen right. in college, right? So, um, and we know that a lot of students love learning online. And right now, our, our students were having fun with their teachers. I remember the first day we kind of went live with our online learning. The kids were like, oh my gosh, I saw my teacher on Zoom. You know, <laughs> that was so much. And, and we gave our teachers the opportunity to be very creative in their lessons. So there was some some good things that kind of came out of this being forced in this um, this virtual uh, world. Um, but what it also made us a very, it was brought front and center for us is the lack of technology that we had in our school district. So we now know that in order for us to use technology to move us forward, we have to make that investment um, and ask the device and also the hotspots. When we learn that many of our families did not have access to Wi-Fi, so we're partnering with the city. I met with the mayor and I said, we have to you know, find a way to, that's a long-term plan. How do we make sure that Wi-Fi is like a public utility? And, and he's been committed to working on that. And in the short term, we're just gonna have to purchase hotspots because we have kids that live all over the city and they have to have access um, to the learning modules and, uh, and providing Wi-Fi um, and, and hotspots you know, uh, allowed us to do that. You know, there really has become uh, very clearly a disparity oh, yeah. in this time of technology. We know that students who are in households that maybe don't have technology available, that don't have parents who are technology, you know, masters, who suddenly are trying to do remote learning. The parents also don't know how to tap into these systems. So what happens to these students who are already disadvantaged, who, who now are months behind their peers because they haven't been able to get the kind of learning experience we would want all of our students to do? This really shines a light on that disparity between those who have and those don't, who don't have, doesn't it? it? Oh, absolutely. And that's one thing that we, make, we have to make sure that we close that gap as quickly as possible. And so if we are investing in our students and say, we have this new online curriculum, but oh, unfortunately you can't access it because you don't have a hotspot, you don't have Wi-Fi, then shame on us. We have to work with our partners and say, we have a dilemma and how can we close this gap? And some partners stepped up. Um, we have partners who provided 1,600 hotspots for us immediately to say, what do you need, superintendent? Um, and again, we have the mayor who's stating, what do you need moving forward and how can we close that gap? So we won't be able to close all the gaps because we don't have broadband Wi-Fi available for all of our families. But if we, we're going to our partners and saying that our students need access, we have to provide this for our students and our families. We have to provide more training for our families. Um, our teachers have been working with our families. Even we think about the social and emotional learning that occurs in our students. We have our school counselors and social workers having kind of those telehealth kind of meetings and they're calling their students and one parent said, oh my gosh, Dr. Dixon, it was so odd listening to my daughter have her counseling session <laughs> and she's kind of listening in the back background, right. but that's where we're headed. Right. And shame on us if we don't utilize this opportunity to elevate learning in this, in this virtual space. So we have an opportunity and we cannot lose this opportunity to be more creative and more responsive to these new learners and be responsible to our parents in this, in this way. Yeah, Dr. Gervasi, I imagine when these students who have been challenged on the high school level when they get to the college campus, you see a clear difference in students who have maybe come from a district like Upper Arlington and students who have come from a district that doesn't have the technology, the resources, the parental right. finances available to them. We are very conscious of the disparity in resources and access. And that's why just a couple of years ago, we started what we call the Panther Promise Program in partnership with the district. So we now welcome about, I mean, we have always welcomed students from Columbus City Schools, but now we have uh, special scholarships and other support, both te uh, technology and academic and social support for about three dozen uh, students. For us, that, that's fairly significant because we're small. Also because we're small, we were able to expand our Wi-Fi access on campus. 
uh, and we have a limited number of laptops that we can loan students. Not for everyone, but limited number. But if students don't have sufficient access to technology at home, and it's not their day to be in class, they could still come to campus and we're gonna have a whole, uh, many points on campus where they can access technology through computer labs that'll be socially distant and, uh, and other laptops so that they could be on campus even if they're not actually in the classroom for a specific course. But it is definitely something that we're very aware of because that's been a historical mission of Ohio Dominican University founded by the Dominican Sisters of Peace to serve the underserved. And uh, the irony is, of course, that we don't have uh, a lot of resources ourselves as an institution, and so we try to be as smart and scrappy as we can to, to make those available to as many students as possible. Yeah, well, Dr. Dixon, you are running the largest school district in the state. We already know from the governor that tax revenues are down dramatically because the economy shut down. We have a 16% unemployment rate. We know that the state is looking to cut revenue at a time when you're saying you need more resources. So what's the answer to that? Like, How much cash on hand do you have right now? You have a billion dollar budget. How much cash do you have on hand that can get you through this crisis? Well, wait, I think this is the time that we reach out to our, our partners. Um, one of the things that um, I stated during my first year, that partnerships are so important, but that we should not ask for the sake of asking. So we should really work with our partners to see exactly what it is that, that we need, and then when it's appropriate, we go. So this entire first year, we have just been listening, um, aligning the partnership work, um, their goals to our goals, and making sure that that worked. We've not asked for money. So now I think it's the time to say we have a clear need, and that need is with technology. Providing a device, a Chromebook for our students, and providing um, a, a hotspot website. Um, Financially, when we think of a district our size and with these new um, um, criteria and guidelines, we know it's going to cost us more money to do it, but we have to. Um, and so I think when we think about um, is it going to cost us more to educate students in a blended space? Absolutely. Is it going to cost us more money to even educate our students at K-12 online? Yes, in many ways, because we have to have the, the technology and the infrastructure to do so. Um, but we also have to think of how do we feed our students, right? So we are thinking about in a blended learning, are we going to deliver lunches to our meals to our families on the days they're not in session? So those are things we also have to think about when we're talking about resources and, and needing additional money for it. Our students are still eating. We're still providing lunch for our students now and through the summer. So those are some uh, costs that we will still incur. Um, but again, we want to make sure that when we go and ask our partners for additional support, we know exactly what it is so that they can see a return on their investment. We can show them how we use those dollars, and we're showing that we, were, we are being very responsible. I don't want to put you on the spot, but can you identify some partners who you think will step forward and say, here we go, we've got the technology. The Let's put call. them on the spot. <laughs> who, who do you think is going to be able to step oh forward gosh. and pull you out of this technology quagmire? Well, you know what, we already have the city of Columbus. You know, the mayor has been, you know, he said, Talisa, tell us what you need. Um, and I have my team working on a plan, because I think it's important and responsible for us to say, this is what we need and this is why and this is what we were going to do with those resources. So they have been, um, they stepped forward first. Um, also, I know I can. I know I can. They stepped up and provided 600 hotspots for us. Um, oh, um, um, the transit, I mean, they, CODA, CODA, CODA stepped up and said, you know, when the pandemic first hit, to say, Talisa, what do you need? I said, I need to make sure that my families can get to the feeding sites. She said, no problem. So they, she 
open up a bus route and say we get our families there. So those are the types of things we have partners that are saying, what do you need? And we're able to tell them. And it's not about saying, oh, I need $500,000 for this and I think I'm going to do this. I know exactly what I need money, those dollars for. And as we continue to develop our plan, we will be very crystal, we'll be crystal clear with our partners of what we need and why we need it and how we are going to show them how we utilize those resources. One, uh, another example of collaboration, we're trying to do what we can. Uh, some members of uh, Dr. Dixon's team and mine are currently discussing yet another partnership between the district and, and ODU, what we call our Educational Partners Agreement that will provide, offer significant uh, discounts really uh, on tuition for uh, employees of Columbus oh. City Schools because a lot of this is also new for those who have to do it. Yeah. And since we have a very strong education division, it seems like it would be a good fit. Yes, so. How are you preparing future teachers, which I know is a big part of your yes. education right. platform at, yeah. at ODU, how are you preparing these teachers for the environment they are about to go into? Yeah, it, what, I am so impressed with the caliber of the folks we have. In fact, you might want to consider a forum just on that subject. And uh, Dr. Marlissa St uh, Stauffer, who is the chair of our division, is just a dynamo and a highly creative and very responsive. And uh, so we have quite a number of education related majors and she is in touch with uh, school districts throughout the region to place our students and also help them realize what, what they're gonna experience so that informs the pedagogy of our professors. Yeah. You know, Dr. Dixon, I know traditionally over the past several years, long before you got here, Columbus has struggled with a reputation of not getting a good grade on the state level mm -hmm. for the students that they are producing. We know the poverty rate is higher in the district. We know there are not as many, let's say, college-educated parents. You have challenges that some of the suburban districts don't have. Is this going to widen that gap on performance that we've seen in the past between Columbus and some of the other districts in Central Ohio? Oh, a absolutely, if we don't do it right. You know, if we, we have um, recently we had a um, Phi Delta Kappa curriculum audit, curriculum management audit, and the results from that audit um, just showed and demonstrated that we didn't have the, the curriculum that we needed for all of our students. So there was an equity issue across the district. So now we're moving forward and we're going to use this online platform as a way to say we have a new curriculum, we've purchased new curriculum, we are training our teachers, um, we're excited about the new curriculum. It was totally teacher buy-in, and we're excited about what that curriculum is going to do in a different platform for our students. Um, we hope that we don't see a further gap. We, it will occur if we don't have the technology for our parents and the training for our parents and our students. So we, we must have the technology. We will have the professional development for our teachers. We will have the opportunity for staff members to work with parents, all of our parents, even though our parents that with, with, um, with, may have an English learning barrier. So, um, so the English language learners, we, we will t make sure that all of our parents, all of our students and teachers understand what this new platform is going to look like. And again, this is where some of our partners can come in. You know, how can we utilize our partners in a very different way to make sure that students have additional supports that they need? So it is an opportunity that we give to our, uh, our community and say we have 51,000 students who are depending on us to get this right. So how do we come together and we wrap our arms around this district and say that we are going to ensure that those students have everything that they need, even with our partnerships with the colleges and make sure that their teacher, people who are going into the um, education field now know that that is going to look different and how do we partner next year? What would that experience, that field experience look like for, for those new teachers? Um, so it is an opportunity for us to say, this is the new normal, right? Um, but we can elevate um, 
learning platforms in a very different way if we work together and we really identify those things that are barriers for our students and find partners who can help us eliminate those barriers. When you say this curriculum will be different, give yeah. me some examples of how this new curriculum will work and how it might tackle some of the deficiencies that we've seen in the past. So, so currently um, we have, we will, in the past we've used various different um, curriculums across the district. So for example, we've used a lot of pilot programs. So if you would attend school A and you happen to move to school B, you may, that student may be introduced to a, to a totally different curriculum. So they may have to relearn something or catch up because what school B had a different curriculum than school A. So now every third grader, for example, or second grader, will be taught the same standards from the same textbook. The teachers will be trained on the same curriculum. Um, and so we believe that that is going to allow us when we do our formative assessments to see where some of the gaps are. So, and then doing it in a learning, in a, an online uh, platform. Our students are used to online anyway. When you think about, um, I never forget, I walked in a classroom and um, the teacher had some older computers and the student was just staring at the computer and staring at the mouse, probably trying to figure out, how do you operate this thing? You know, because our students are used to swiping, you know? Right. So, and they're used to sitting and learning from, think about Sesame Street and all those different programs, you know, Know, that they are used to learning in it. They, we as adults, you know, we're not used to teaching in that way and using um, technology to comp to accompany our, our lessons that we're teaching. So I think it's going to allow for more creativity for our teachers. The teachers are more excited, I think, than some of the kids. Some are nervous, right? But some are really excited because they know that you can use an online platform um, in many ways to teach differently. But we do know that we still need some of that um, in-person time. That's going to be the challenge because some of our students, school was their livelihood. They spent their entire lives, they have more memories of their school than they do home. So how do we make sure that we fill that gap in is going to be a challenge. But I think if we utilize our partners um, to help us find ways to still have um, some in-person activities for our students, that, that is going to um, help assist us. It almost sounds as if you feel like this online learning could be a, a, an advantageous for yes. Columbus City Schools. Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I was just going to say what you're hearing really from both of us and you would hear from our colleagues yeah. is that there is a spirit of resilience yeah. that will turn problems into opportunities. And yeah, whether it's online learning or social distancing, how can we still relate? How can we gather even if we are socially distant? Yeah. We'll figure it out. Yeah. And I think that sense of commitment and positivity and confidence and resilience ultimately is what will win the day. Well, we see funding issues on the university college level as well. You mentioned that you need volume when you switch to the online, but there are other issues that are going to be out there as well. Housing issues, separation issues. Right. How, how much of a financial hit is this going to be for Ohio's colleges? Uh, it's, it's going to be significant and it's really going to depend depend on, on each college. Uh, I have to give a, I guess, shout out is what the expression <laughs> students use, uh, to our chancellor, Randy Gardner, who meets weekly with college presidents to just keep current on the evolving response to all of these concerns. And we talk a lot about how can the state be of help given its limitations and the needs of, uh, of of the school districts to to meet these challenges, but it, it will be it will be a challenge. And and just as Dr. Dixon talked about partnerships with the universities, so universities are doing everything they can to partner with one another. Yeah, yeah. But you both sound I I'm surprised that you both sound optimistic about how this is going to work in the fall because frankly families are worried. Yeah. They're worried about how do I go to work. How am I going to pay for this? Do I have to buy masks for my children? Right. Yeah. But you seem to have, both of you, a sense of optimism here. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We have to. Uh, you know, as I stated earlier, they're dependent on us to get it right. 
Uh, so, and we're listening to our parents, and we, quite honestly, have to do more of it now. You know, we, we, we have to listen to our parents, listen to their needs, really have an understanding about each household. So, for example, when we were giving um, a laptops out, we gave uh, 13,000 laptops out initially. Families were calling us and said, guys, one Chromebook for a household is not enough. I have three or four students here. We need more Chromebooks. So we initially we got out, so now we're up to 19,000 Chromebooks, wow. over 19,000 that we've loaned out. But because families said what you provided is not enough. So we have to make sure that we're listening and being responsive to our parents in ways that we probably wouldn't, didn't, didn't have to do in the past, but now it's so much more important because they now are, are spending more time with their babies um, and understanding really what they need and they need us to help fill that gap. So I'm optimistic because you know 51,000 kids are depending on me to get it right. And I wanna make sure that we, that those students are prepared for once they leave us and and go to you. Yeah. Sounds good. <laughs> and we, as a tradition, allow audience members to ask questions at the Metropolitan Club and throughout this uh, conversation this morning, there have been members online who have been weighing in, and Jane Scott joins us now with a few questions from some of our members. More than a few. <laughs> Tisha Brady, Dear Black Parent, from Dear Black Parent, what is being done to address the gaps for students who were behind before the pandemic and those that disappeared due to the lack of resources of, on, of going online or picking up school packets? Yes, that's a great question. We, our data is showing that we have about 70% of our students who have logged in and are working online. So we know that there's a, a gap in some students that we've not been able to touch base with. So we're working now on how to um, find those families and those students. And think we have summer school is currently happening now and we changed our summer school. Um, this is the first time we've offered a K-12 summer school on virtual. Um, um, a platform, but we also have days where teachers are there and students can contact their teachers. And we also have other staff members who are helping us find the students and find the families so that we can get them the resources um, that they need. But that has been, you know, acknowledged that that is um, something that we we recognize. We we are looking um, for ways to make sure that we close that gap. Thirty percent, though. That means 30% have not connected, if 70% if have. So have those 30% yeah. 30, 30 just dropped off of your radar? We don't know if it's one, um, did they not have the Wi-Fi? Because remember, we, we've yeah. give, we've give, we've, we gave the technology. Um, did they not know how to use it? Um, so we're still figuring those numbers out. But about a few weeks ago, we knew we were up to 70%. Um, and so we were excited about that because we initially, that we were down to 30 and 40 percent until we started providing the Chromebook. So when families were saying we need the device, then families came back and said we needed the Wi-Fi. So we made some assumptions, you know, we made an assumption that everyone had Wi-Fi, and that's not the case. Um, so it was a lesson for us. And so as we move forward, we want to make sure that we, we get it right and we give the families and the students the resources that they need. This is a related question from Theta Sampson. How will you measure student engagement and student success? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, now we're um, measuring engagement from the amount of time that the students are logging in to their online platforms and spending with their with their teachers. Um, and we're st they're still doing lessons. We, we wanted to make sure, too, um, that even during this period, that students were still learning. And some, we got some pushback from that. But I wanted students to say, if anything, during this, this, this global pandemic, they knew their teachers and they knew their friends and they knew learning was something that they did on their, that was their routine. So we had to make sure that we had those resources and um, for our students, if they're still doing your math, still read a book a night, um, still have an opportunity to touch base with your guidance counselors, those were important. And as we move forward in this um, virtual, uh, with this virtual platform, we have to make sure that we're saying to our 
our parents and our students, you have to log in. Here are the times that you log in. You have to make sure you have that interface time. So it's, it's learning, it's moving um, our organization to uh, this virtual space that we'll be able to get the data that we need. And this is a question that I have. It seems like from everything you've said that this experience is gonna be a real learning experience for the parents who may not have computer mm -hmm. skills or language skills. Um, and they're gonna be much more engaged with their children. Oh yes, yeah. so last year we um, I opened an office of engagement, so we have a chief of engagement, and the reason I did that, because my first 100 days in the district, the families were saying, you're not communicating enough with us. We're not being heard. So I saw that as very different from the office of communication. So we created the office of engagement with family ambassadors, and these people are listening to parents, they're finding the resources, for example, we families were calling and they, did very, they needed very different resources when the pandemic first started. We were able to provide the different resources to our families through partners because of our Office of Engagement. But you're absolutely right. That was something that was missing. We can't just tell families what they need. We have to make sure that we're listening and engaging and trying to find ways to meet their needs, whatever those needs may be. And I think we're, we're doing a pretty good job of that right now. Bill Lafayette from Regionomics asks this, so much of learning is outside of the classroom on playgrounds and in social clubs where young people learn the norms and expectations of relating to others and living in a community. In this as is this aspect being lost and how can it be preserved? And Robert Shelley has a similar question, what are extracurricular activities going to look like? Yeah, and we're still figuring that out. Um, and, and that's part of what we're asking for the patients because right now, um, you know, our health guidelines are saying that you, you, you only can have maybe six people. You know, if you go outside, you're wearing a mask. We've closed our playgrounds and our basketball courts off until the end of the month because we want to make sure that whatever the pathway, that we make sure that um, we are being responsive, responsible um, and keeping our students safe. Um, and so we're still figuring that piece out. A similar question could be asked of our colleges and universities, yeah, though, yeah. because part of the campus experience right, yeah. is is communal, not only communal living, but gathering, gathering. and socializing and right. meeting people from other parts right. of the country and world that maybe you right. hadn't before had a chance to interact with. How right. do you keep that alive on a college campus? Right, as Dr. Dixon said, it's a, it's a work in progress, yeah. and we try to use technology as best we can. Uh, for example, one of the things uh, that our trustees have agreed to participate in, we're going to create what we call the Trustees Mentor Program. We're going to have a schedule where each week one of our trustees will have a live stream conversation with our students about their work, their industry, and the skills required to succeed in it and establish personal relations relationships between our trustees and directly with our students that actually could only have happened with technology. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to see the strengths of technology as well as the fact that it's picking up the pieces. Yeah. Yeah. This question comes from Cheney Scott, big brothers, big sisters of Central Ohio. How can community partners that were in the buildings before coronavirus help serve the schools they were in? If it comes to the point where we are not physically allowed in the building, what are some alternative ways to help each other continue on the work that was being done? Yes, great. So we have nine working groups, and one of the working groups is on partnerships. So if he would go online and go to our website, and he would get some information about how he can join that working group that's working uh, on that particular project. Okay, great. This question's from Barb Seckler. As the biggest school system in Ohio, what are the most important measures the state legislature can take to assist Columbus City Schools with funding for the pandemic, reopening schools, and improving academic excellence? Wow. What's your wish list? Yeah, oh my gosh. <laughs> you know, I, I think just, just listening to us and just having that conversation and saying what is it that you need. Um, I think that's first and foremost because school, the, the, the funding, school, um, Ohio schools funding, um, that, well, that's a separate issue. But we need um, support and just come listen and have a conversation with us, and we will be able to share what we what we need. 
You know, I'm and also, I also want to ask you, Dr. Dixon, there has been talk for so long that there are too many buildings in the Columbus yeah. school system, mm -hmm. that the school size, the, the yeah. there were, I think there were 100,000 students when I moved here back in the 80s, and we're down to about 51,000. Yeah. So are you looking more seriously now during this economic crisis that's being created by the pandemic with all these people doing distance learning? Are you considering closing buildings? We've not had the discussion yet, but we know that we're going to go back and look at our facilities master plan. We know we, we have to address it. Um, right now, I think we're going to possibly need those buildings to social distance ourselves right. in this new learning platform. Um, but again, we have been, I've been mindful of that since I've, I've, I've been here. And, and those are the conversations that we have to have with our public. And as learning, again, as we utilize this virtual platform, we know that we may need to use our buildings differently. We are already talking about, for example, our um, central office building. You know, we are there and it's so eerie being there. We have our mask on and we're walking down the halls and waving. Um, what would that space look like when we move forward? You know, our, our, and, and that is a concern. Think about your, your teacher's desk, your student's desk. How do you space the main office? Those are some things that we have to look at because those guidelines are telling us you have to be six feet apart. Mm -hmm. And some of those little small elementary schools, you know, you're just kind of nestled there together. Um, so we're going to have to re-image our schools, but I think we, uh, we would be remiss if we didn't allow this virtual platform and use technology to elevate and have us rethink what does the K-12, pre-K-12 space looks like moving forward. Trip Lazarus asks, are you worried that classrooms will become more segregated vis-a-vis -vis economic status? Will those who can afford to keep themselves at home? Mm, good question. Great question, great really question. Um, I hope not, uh, but that's a great question that we're gonna have to take some time and seriously think about, right? Yeah. Michelle Thomas asks, what are the expectations of principals and district leadership for this upcoming school year? Yeah, we, we need our leaders, the, the same expectations that they had before, that they are leading their schools. They've been doing such a great job too. We have some leaders even that are um, supervising our, our, our summer programs. But we still want our leaders to create the culture, even this virtual culture, um, support their teachers, be there for their students and their families. Those expectations have not changed. They just have to do it in a more creative and innovative way. And quickly, we've been asked for Dr. Dixon to repeat where people can sign up to participate in work groups. They can go online and look at, I think um, we posted everything yesterday, if I'm not mistaken, and there is there should be a website or email address there that you can um, submit if you're interested in um, um, participating in one of the nine working groups. Before we let each of you go, we've been talking about how you move forward and finances. I want each of you, your main responsibility is to students. Yes. So before we close out, could you each give a message to your students as we are moving forward, what you want them to know about what you are doing to welcome them home? Yeah. Well, to all of my Columbus City Schools students, um, I understand that this is not the summer you hope for. It was not the end of the year that you hoped for. Um, but I am so excited that we are planning for your return. So please take the time to read, maybe um, socialize in a very social distancing way, um, and continue being that bright, shining star that you always have been. Send us emails, reach out to your teachers and your guidance counselors and to your friends and know that we love you and that we are planning for your return. And we're excited to see you one day um, this fall. And to our students at Ohio Dominican University, we too are excited to see you in the fall and encourage you to see this hardship also as an opportunity to learn resilience in an even deeper way and flexibility. You know, we say that we try to educate you to 
have not only your first job, but lifetime of successful career and successful personal life. And that means an ability to adapt. And boy, this is a life lesson that none of us anticipated, how to adapt to this. And believe me, we're gonna get through this together, and when we do, you can handle anything if you can handle this. So hang in there with us. Thank you both so much. Okay. Wow. All of our special reports have really been themed with balancing reality with optimism. And bright shining stars, we love you. Welcome back, we can't wait to see you. I don't see how much more optimistic we could get. So thank you so much, it's been wonderful. We hope that those of you who are watching today will tune in next Wednesday at noon, which is also our first live stream forum that will have an in-house audience. There are still a few seats available for so, so some of you who want to join us and the other 50 people who are in the room to uh, hear Richard Cordray talking about consumer protection and his new book, Watchdog, as we welcome our live stream special report series next Wednesday. We're grateful for our live stream partners, NBC4, NBC4i, WOSU Public Media, PNC, Tommy Daly Foundation, Morpsy, Dispatch Media Group, and OSU Wexner Medical Center. And thank you so much to our speakers, Dr. Dixon, thank you so much, Dr. Gravazzi, thank you so much. Colleen Marshall, you're a star. Talk about a shining star. Thank you, Colleen, and thanks to all of you who uh, donated to the Columbus Metropolitan Club by purchasing virtual seats. We look forward to having you in the audience sometime soon, but until then, stay well and be safe. <laughs>